So as you heard uh, from my girls and from Ravi, um, Linda Brown was an amazing person. I, uh, this is how I would have described her. Uh, amazing educator with an impeccable character, a great friend, an incredible wife and mom, brilliant, strongly organized, visionary, compassionate, loyal, a woman of phenomenal faith, encourager, always having time for others. And she is the true superwoman of the Messianic movement. So just a couple pictures to give you some perspective. This is their family. Uh, Linda is on the left. And Josh, who is 27, by the way, went to his bar mitzvah uh, 14 years ago, which was absolutely amazing and had me crying most of the time. Uh, next to him is Kelly, who is Michael's wife. So she's the uh, daughter-in-law. Um, and then there's Michael, who is the son of Steve. And, and you can see how much he looks like his dad, Steve, who is standing next to him. And then there's Melissa, um, who probably will take over as the mom of the family because that's just who she is. She's an amazing gal as well. And uh, uh, their other child, uh, Linda's other child. So, you know, I'm going to talk about uh, really families, but, but all the things I'm saying will be true of Linda. Linda was probably the most amazing person I think I've ever met um, because she is the whole package. There are very few people I could say is the whole package, and, and she just was. Um, so I looked up uh, defining what a family is online, and it says a social group made up of parents and their children. Eh, let's not call that a, a definition. Here's, here's what Charles Swindoll said about family, and we're gonna go through this slowly because I want you to pick up on some of this stuff. The family, and, and kids, if you're here and you can read, I I'm hope you're reading along with me, even though I might not hear you. The family is where you put down your first roots, where you form your most lasting impressions, where you put together the building blocks of your character, and where you determine whether you will view life through eyes of prejudice or acceptance. Whoa. Okay. That is, I think, pretty heavy. Um, look, I certainly agree. It's, it's where our roots are. Uh, it's, it, we have lasting impressions of our family. Um, it's certainly a family is to help us grow our character, but this last one is very interesting that it, it uh, we view life through the eyes of prejudice or acceptance. Have to think about that a little. And I'm, when I think about my parents, was it through prejudice or acceptance? Uh, it's an interesting thought to think about what you are showing to your kids uh, what your kids are picking up from us, even if you're not biological family together. Okay, let's look at the second part. Family is where you learn to laugh and where you are allowed to weep without losing respect. Family is where you learn how to share and how to relate and how to treat other people. Family is where you learn how to interpret your surroundings correctly it is where you discover how to draw the line between right and wrong, between good and evil. So to me, this is a wonderful definition of family because there is so much intensity um, and intentionality of what a family is. And I pray that all of our families are like that. Uh, there are different types of families. I just mentioned them. It's kind of obvious. There's biological, there's extended biological, meaning maybe they're not biological to you like aunts and 
I mean cousins and so on, but uh, friends, congregation, organizations with uh, a cause, uh, certainly Messianic, Christian, and the United States. And this, this weekend is July 4th. And uh, July 4th represents the founding uh, in, 19, in 1776 of the uh, Declaration of Independence. It's really uh, an important day to remember because it's when beca we became independent. I remember the day I became independent from my parents when I went off to college. That was a pretty good day, too. Uh, one of the things about families, whether it's the USA or any of these other families, is none of them are perfect. None of them are perfect. Our kids aren't perfect. We as parents aren't perfect. We as siblings aren't perfect. We are just not perfect. But one of the reasons that uh, there is strife in families, one of the reasons, is when one of the people in the family choose to not walk with the Lord. And, uh, you know, in, in the Israelites, they knew God, they knew about God, but they were not walking with the Lord. Families are also a place where there are a lot of hurts. People hurt you the most in families because you care about them the most. So everything, you're more sensitive about it. Somebody can say the same thing to you as your mom or dad, depending on who pushes your button. And, and all of a sudden, when your mom or dad says it, you're, you're in tears. But if somebody else says it, eh, no big deal. Because family is is such a key part to your emotional quotient that you are way more sensitive with family than you would be with others. So I want to talk briefly as to what makes a good family. Number one, it could be the number one thing, in my opinion. It's, the, it's whether we're talking about Sharesh David or we're talking about a biological family, is the family has to have a vision. You have to have a vision of direction, of where you're going. Now, hopefully Messianic families get a vision from knowing God and wanting to follow God, and so that's the core value of that family. So prayerfully, we expect everybody to kind of fall in line there. And uh, in the parasha, God uh, talks about the Moedim, the appointed times, like Shabbat and others, and so shows us the values in Messianic Judaism. It's not all the values, but one of the values is that we celebrate the times of Shabbat and the other holy days with the Lord. And if somebody asks you about Messianic Judaism, it's probably one of the first things you tell them. And that's what we do. Our vision is to see our family together, celebrating these holy days together. And look, I realize it's difficult sometimes to get here, but there is something that strengthens us and it's not all about numbers, but it's about feeling the sense that we are all together and we are making a joyful noise to the Lord. We are worshiping together. We are working our lives out together because we're a family. Look, when I say that Shoresh David is a family, I'm not saying that we're all great and we're all anything. I'm just saying that we come together to develop something, and there is a vision to develop this group of people who are caring about one another and caring about what God says. And another part of this vision, obviously, is following God's Word. And so 
when we do these things, it produces loyalty. And loyalty is a key to family. And really, that's why we have the July 4th holiday, is because we are loyal to the United States. We're loyal to what it stands for, independence. Now, so the first thing I would say is that you have to have a vision. Secondly, the people in the family should be faithful. Now, I believe that faithful is different than loyal. Loyal means that you always want um, to be part of the team. You are loyal to the team. This is my family. This is my team. But faithful means you'll not only be loyal, but you'll do whatever you can to make it better. As Becca and Sarah were talking uh, about gifts and giving, and Ravi, uh, all about giving, that's what we're talking about here. Faithfulness is when you are blessed to give, that you see the inherent beauty of giving and giving. And in this parasha, we see an interesting thing. There's this fellow by the name of Pinchas, and he is faithful to what God wanted, and his faithfulness was able to put, a, first of all, stop a plague where 24,000 were killed, but also that God wanted to just do away with Israel. And because of Pinchas' faithfulness, God, God's anger was, was stopped. Now, Pinchas did this as a sign of faithfulness, but it kept the family going. And so faithfulness is extremely important. Obviously, love, number three. Everyone expects to have love in the family, but I've got to tell you that I don't even know what that word means anymore because all I think people think about when they say love is romanticized kind of feelings. And I want to see the characteristics of love. I want to see people talking about what they're doing because of the love that they have for one another. I don't want people to tell me they love me and then not show it. Love has to look like something. I can't tell you how many times people have said, oh, I love you, and I love Shoresh David, and I love the Messianic movement, and that was the last week I ever saw them. <laughs> you know, when Lot left Abraham, it was Abraham who blessed Lot. I don't think you can leave somewhere without a blessing. In other words, you can't leave your family without your family blessing you. When you go off to college, your family blesses you, hopefully. Um, you know, when Rebecca left her family to be with Isaac, she left with their blessing. And look, that's why we prayed over Kate today. Because when we prayed over Kate, we were saying, not only we're praying blessings on her, but we're also saying, your family. And you can go wherever you want to go, but you're still family. You never lose your family here. And, and that's, I believe, the way it should be. Families work together in such a way, so when they show love, they do things in tandem. Love also includes respect. Now, I'll tell you, you might say, well, I don't respect, respect that person because of how they act. Well, my answer to you is I didn't ask you to respect what they did. I ask you to respect, act in respect to them. We have to show being respectful at all times. And we have to, our kids have to see that. We can't make those off-color jokes. Oh, I was just joking. We know that every joke has some seriousness to it. So... We don't give a pass for poor taste in jokes. It's important to show that we are respectful. Respectful of the president, respectful of the Congress, respectful of whomever. I was just trying to mention people I don't care for. <laughs> you 
Love also includes spending time together. We've got to make a habit of spending time together. Four, security. A family needs to feel secure. And I pray that people who are part of Shoresh David who are here feel secure. You should feel uh, emotionally secure. Now, look, I realize some people are going to be rude to you, and that's going to happen uh, because we're a family, and it just, it just happens. And uh, it's unfortunate, but it's true. And as family, you just say, eh, it's okay. Just throw it off. You know, it's, it's, Proverbs says it's to your glory to overlook an offense. And uh, so we, we want, obviously, physical security. We want financial security. You want to know that any monies that you pour into Shoresh David are being used for the kingdom and not for any other purpose. You want to know that it's handled correctly. You, there are, so there are a lot of security issues in a family. And, uh, you know, sometimes... Your family is drowning. Sometimes there are things going on in your family where they need to be rescued. We see, for instance, Abraham rescued Lot when he was captured. And uh, oftentimes, that's what family does. You see them hurt or, or struggling, and you go and you rescue them. Number five, communication. Communication is, is certainly a key to a healthy family. It means that we will not only speak, but we will listen, and our communication will be encouraging. Now, I've got to tell you that when it comes to uh, encouraging, which is number six, it's important in our family to be an encourager. And I, I'll give you a couple examples. One is uh, Elijah. Uh, he was all alone. He went to the Lord. He didn't have, uh, you know, anybody. He felt he was the only believer on the earth. And God encouraged him and said, look, there's 7,000 left who will not bow down to Baal. So God was saying, you have a family. There's 7,000 of them. Go find them. This is 1 Kings, by the way, part of today's parasha in 1 uh, Kings 19.18, part of the Haftorah portion. A totally different look at encouragement uh, is one of my stories about Linda. So I, I told you that Linda, well, maybe I didn't stress it. Linda had one of the most beautiful qualities was that even when she was correcting you, she was encouraging you. That is very, very difficult. And, uh, but she just encouraged, and that's how she thought. We are going to encourage. So, you know, here we were at school. I was the principal. She was the vice principal. The parents were sitting kind of where you're sitting. And, you know... I'm just saying, we need volunteers. We, I'm, you know, so Linda and I are sitting at the table, um, and Linda says to me right before we begin, which she would say before every meeting, now, Steve, remember, if you're going to get negative, I'm going to kick you. <laughs> and she did. Because, because negativity wouldn't produce the results of encouragement. And, and it's such a hard lesson to learn because we, I, I don't know where we get it from, this negativity of, of responding in ways that are negative. But it is destructive. And that's why uh, I believe Linda had such an amazing life. I'll tell you... Well, I won't tell you some stories, but I will just say in a broad sense of the term that Linda was treated poorly a number of times that I saw where she was treated poorly. And yeah, did it bother her? Of course it bothered her. But she never ran away. She never said anything negative, And she always bounced back as if nothing happened. 
And she was the furthest thing from a doormat that I know. But in terms of being offended or not offended, she was a doormat. She, she would allow people to, to do this to her and, and not even flinch. Just an amazing, amazing, and, and if we could do that in our families, do you, listen to this testimony. So we're at the funeral, and Steve, the husband, says the following, Linda and I, in all our years of marriage, never had a fight. That says it all, doesn't it? <laughs> For those of us who are married. <laughs> How many have never had a fight? Anybody in this room never had a fight with your husband or wife? Yeah. That's so, I, and, and he said this in front of, I don't know how many people were at the funeral, maybe a couple hundred. And uh, I was just amazed. A family, number seven, must produce growth. There has to be growth. And I understand that Leo's irritated at me. I get it. And I'll be able to handle that as long as he keeps singing. And, but but it's, it's growth. It's growth. It's, it's when we do these things, when we step out of our box, when we step out of what's comfortable, we become better at whatever it is we do. We become better. And, and people who are, you know, Becca said she's an introvert. I definitely am an introvert. But I'm called to get out of that box of being an introvert daily. And it's always uncomfortable. But, you know, too bad for me. It's what's required. It's what's required. And, and that grows us so that we get over what is natural for us in order to be what is not natural, which is to build up the family. It is not natural for all of us to think, my job in this family is to build it up, whether it's your biological or Shoresh David or the Messianic movement. That's not normal for us. What can I do to build up the family? But that is what we should be doing. Growth, growth within us. And finally, we should have spiritual unity. That doesn't mean we agree on everything in the Bible. In fact, far from it. If you know anybody in this congregation, uh, you will know that there are a lot of disagreements uh, in terms of what Scripture means. But the unity is there of the majors, of Yeshua being deity, of, of who the Lord is and what he has done, and the Bible is the Word of God, and we need to use it as our instructional book. Those things are unifiers, and we have to be, and, and we want to walk in the Lord. I mean, that is spiritual unity. I'd like to close with three scriptures. The first one is Hebrews 10, 22 to 25. So let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and body washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the unwavering confession of hope, for he who promised is faithful. And now these words come. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good deeds. So I am picking on Leo today, but Leo, Scripture says that you're supposed to stir me up to love and good deeds. Figure out how to do that. No, seriously, all of us. I mean, if I call everybody's name and I say, okay, this is your job. Your job today is to stir up somebody else. I won't even say one another, which implies everybody. <laughs> stir up one person, one person today to love and good deeds. What does that even look like? Go ahead, do it. Not now, but when we say Shabbat Shalom. 
And then it says, do not neglect our own meetings, as it is the habit of some, but encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Look, the day is approaching. The day, to some degree, is here. We are being persecuted. If you follow the government, if you follow what's going on in this country, we are being persecuted. Not just Messianic Jews, but Christians are being persecuted. And we are going to see more of that. And the, re the thing that will make us strong, that will keep us strong, is if we have a strong family by our side to handle this persecution. That's what made Jewish people Jewish people to begin with. They were persecuted and persecuted, and it kept them together. The more we feel that we have millions of bucks and we can do all of whatever we want, we will not be part of family. We'll do our own thing, and there will be nobody there for us when things get bad. Family has to be together. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all ways into Messiah, who is the head. From him the whole body is fitted and held together by every supporting ligament. So we see here that the whole body that Yeshua is ahead of, I, I, I don't remember who said it, maybe it was Becca, that everybody has a gift and you should use it. This is what this scripture is really talking about, that if we lack one person, the body isn't working right. The body isn't working right. The proper working of each individual part produces the body's growth for building itself up in love. This is what we are all about. This is why we come together. This is why we get together on Shabbat. One of the reasons. Ephesians 4, 29, 32, the last of the three scriptures. Let no harmful word come out of your mouth. Stop there. I mean, how clear does God have to be? Are we going to be rebellious and say, but they deserved it? <laughs> because that's what we say. It wasn't my fault. Johnny hit me first. Now, adults, we don't say it like that anymore. We just say, did you see how he was to me? How rude? Yeah, so? But God says to you, meaning me, meaning you, let no harmful word come out of your mouth. Is that clear? I mean, do I have to interpret for anybody? Watch this. It gets worse. You think that's bad? It gets worse. It gets worse. Here it goes. But only what is beneficial for building others up according to the need. So we are to build each other up. We're to make each other feel better. But what if they were rude to me? Make them feel better. I, I don't know. I'm just... I'm reading God's Word. I don't know what to tell you about real life. I understand it happens. But if you are following God today and you're following His Word, then this has to speak to your heart. So it gives grace to those who hear it. Then, then it says, Do not grieve the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Well, in the context of what I'm reading, to me, the, then the next few verses are what grieves the Holy Spirit. Here we go. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, quarreling, slander, along with all malice. Instead, be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving each other, just as God and Messiah also forgave you. And that's the last part of it, because God knows that this is going to be a daily occurrence. Somebody's going to offend you. And God wants you to think of the crucifixion daily. And if you have a vision of the crucifixion in your mind and what Yeshua has done for you daily, you will see 
your hurt in light of his hurt. And he said, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. <coughs> At the Shiva, which is the service after the funeral, which lasts, can last for seven days at someone's house in Judaism. At any rate, as Becca already told you, she got him up in front of everybody, and she said, I want to be like Linda. Well, I go ditto. I want to be, oh, I want her to be like Linda. No, I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I want to. I want to be like Linda. I, I want to live my life growing and encouraging all families that I'm part of. And I'm part of a lot of families. I'm part of Beth Yeshua in Philadelphia. I mean, that's family to me. I'm part of the Shoresh David family. I have the biological family. I have the family of rabbis. I have the family in the Messianic movement, that family. And so, they, there are, so there were people who came to the funeral who were not part of Beth Yeshua ever. But I knew them, or I knew a number of them, because they were part of my Messianic family. You are given a gift, and it's up to you whether you receive this gift. And the gift is, if you invest you will have a family that will give back to you more than you have given. To know that you have these families that are in your court to, to help you and to be with you and to love on you and to support you and to encourage you and to give you security and to give you all the things you need in order and, and vision to have a healthy family. That's what we're about, and that's why you are so important. That's why you are so important. We are to reflect Yeshua in every family that God places you in. And that's my goal. So as I close, let me just say, I love you, Linda. May you continue to be amazing in your new family. I pray that, that the Lord will be proud of each one of us as we too strive to grow and encourage each family member that we belong to. Father, I just pray in the name of Yeshua. As we close the service with worship, I just ask, O oh Lord, that you would receive this family's worship and praise to you. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would just touch the hearts of everybody here. Let them decide to be family. And with that, they receive, I pray, undying love and support as we venture through life together. I bless you, Lord. I thank you in the name of Yeshua. Amen.